be missed, he would live on forever. You know? Yep, definitely. Uh, yeah, he would definitely be missed. Um, and I also, um, our prayers need to go out. I mentioned the road to the Apollo, and so I want all of our listeners to know our prayers definitely go out to Captain Newborn. His brother was coming to visit his family, had a stroke. It does not look like he's going to make it. He's actually on life support, and the family is trying to make some very difficult decisions and things of that nature. But, uh, you know, I know that his captain's heart is very heavy because that's his only brother. He has a sister that has already passed on. I think he has two other sisters, so a total of five of them. So this would be the uh, wow. second one to pass if they have to do that. So our hearts definitely go out to uh, Captain Newborn and his family in these very difficult times. But I also understand what he's saying. They don't want to make the rush to judgment because one never knows what kind of miracles God may pull off. And also one never knows what kind of uh, things may happen in people's lives. And also there is that whole controversy of whether people in the medical profession don't sometimes rush you in order to do things so they can get those uh, organs and body parts that they make their money off of and things of that nature. So I can definitely understand the family being torn and the family wanting to make sure that it's the absolute last uh, resort before they make that call. Yeah, you have to, uh, and you said he had a stroke, correct? That is correct. And a lot of times, you're, you're, you're right. When they, I don't know what they are thinking sometimes. They're like, well, we want to do this, and then they get creative, and we want to try this and try this medication or try this. And sometimes it's on point, and sometimes it's too late. You know, so, but then again, like you said, you never know what God has in store for, you know, that person I speak as a three-time stroke survivor. So, you know, I've, fortunately for me, I did not go the opposite way, but it's still, you know, for family members who want to help and there's nothing you can do that has got to be the most desolate feeling because it's like well, what do we do where you don't do anything and then you say you know what you ask the doctors and they're like well we're not sure but we're going to try this and we want to try that well you know what can you try what works but then again you don't know what works so you're stuck and you can only leave it to the Most High to decide if he decides it's time for you to come home, then you come home, you know. But other than that, you just kind of hope that um, – and there have been people who – doctors don't know everything, you know. They, I know some of them would like to, but you never know. He may come out of it and have a story to tell along with it so you know it's real tricky you, you can't it's say very yes tricky. you know you can't say no some people have said doctors don't know a damn thing some people have said the doctor knows everything but the only thing you can do is whatever his will is that that what you know what will be done yep. and, it's, and it may I hurt word from- oh, but yeah I just got word Good. from uh, Josh that he's back online, so hopefully the static monsters are gone, and we'll see if we can actually <laughs> finish this conversation and everything. But I did get a notice from Josh that he is yeah. back online, so let's see if we can put him back in. Okay. I'm, well, I'm here, bro. Jo- there I'm, you go. I'm here. Yes, sir. Yep. Yes, he's sir. Back. Welcome and, back. And less static. <laughs> we like that. Hey. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, so what's going man. on with the static monsters? Those things happen. That's, that's the life of live radio and live just performances in general. You know that from having yep. done shows. I'm sure there are times that you sat there going like, I don't know what happened. But um, oh man, you. many times, many times, brother, many times. Sometimes overseas where I'm, I'm the, me and the sound man don't speak the same language, so it's really challenging. So I've been there, brother. I've been there. I know that's right. Now you were saying we, before the static monsters got us, we were talking about how. There are some people that feel that the city council is already progressive and that you may wind up disrupting what is already a progressive voice out there and wondering why you wouldn't run to a later time when there are some other people that may not be as, uh, say, progressive or as liberal. And you were answering that question, and that's when 
static static villains decided to not have you answer the question. So we'll continue with the yeah. question and pick up where we left off. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll call back in because I want to make sure I finish that point. I only have a few minutes uh, now, but I want to make sure I address it because you're right. Like I said before, you got your ear to the streets. Everyone's asking that. A couple points. So we do have, as I mentioned before, we have a progressive city. Durham is a progressive place. We are fortunate that we have, you know, a, a general consciousness in our city that is uh, focused on things like equity and inclusion and affordability and access to uh, health care and access to resources and, you know, generally promoting a, a high quality of life. Uh, so we are fortunate to live in a progressive city, specifically in the South and in the United States. But I would challenge uh, whether or not the the council is actually progressive. Well, no, let me pause. Our council is certainly progressive. My challenge is how practical the ideas that happen uh, in council are in terms of getting things done. Our communities don't our communities for far too long have 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 sat back and had to listen to ideolo- ideological debate or data points about one thing or another or philosophy or you know someone's theory on how to govern our community and a lot of it is steeped in progressivism but i would challenge how progressive it truly is um if we're not able to actually solve the problems of everyday human beings in durham you know, if you were to look at Mark, if you were to spend, if you were to go in the map of the United States and point out the most progressive cities, like if you were to just guess, give me, give me a, a city in the United States that you think is very progressive available. Which one? What, which ones would you point out? Just give me uh, probably Durham, probably South. Atlanta, maybe uh, some of the ones in California, like LA and San Francisco. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm glad you said those because those are the ones I would say as well. San Francisco is probably the the, the the banner or poster child for progressive governments, right? Right. San Francisco is re- San Francisco has a worse affordability crisis and worse homelessness crisis and worse uh, poverty uh, issues. Far, far, their poverty issues far exceed most countries and most uh, cities in the United States. Um, and so, what I'm referencing is progressive governments, or what we would assume to be progressive governments don't always function from a pragmatic standpoint. So I align with most of the progressive ideals, which is funny when people call me a disruptor, because I'm certainly not a disruptor in terms of, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not right-leaning, right? So you, you don't have to listen to much of my music to, to know where my politics go, uh, lie on the spectrum. But what I believe in is actual tangible, practical solutions for the people of Durham, right? I'm not interested in arguing over who's left enough, who's leaning far left enough, who's you know, who's read enough political theory to understand one highly progressive topic or another. I'm interested in real solutions for Durham. And the issues that we're facing right now are, are an affordability crisis um, that if we don't address it with a cohesive economic strategy, uh, we're going to find ourselves repeating the mistakes of our past and affordable housing plans of the past that if you've ever had a family member like I have, many of my family members who live in affordable or, or public housing, uh, perpetually for generations, and you know that that was a failed policy. Affordable housing policies on the, from the federal level and the state level have failed uh, historically because they, they don't they lack proper perspective and a pragmatic approach uh, and a holistic economic development strategy. So I, I, I'm certainly progressive, and I align with most of the things, um, most of the ideals of our council. I just would like to see us move beyond ideals and into practice, and I think that's where the rub is, and that's why I'm running now um, because because it's the, the, the people on the the ticket that that I'm running that, that I'm opposing um, that I feel are sort of steeped in this ideology and lack a little bit of a pragmatic approach. I can definitely see that kind of argument and everything. Now the other thing I know you got to get off after a short period and everything, but the one question I would want to hear your perspective on is: Do you think that we're doing enough in terms of making sure that our minority business people are getting in enough of the pieces of pie in downtown? I mean, I just came to an event yesterday where I saw Carl Webb, he actually invited me to do a podcast at Providence, I think mm-hmm. it's 1898, if mm-hmm. I remember the number right and everything. But, That's right. That's um, right. And definitely want him on that to do this show and everything. He actually invited us to do it live. Maybe I'll have you come on that one as well. But uh, yep. But I know he's one. But, you know, there's all this growth and development. We've got the people that are unscripted, the people at 21 C. They're not necessarily, you know, minority colors and everything. And I do know that that mm-hmm. was one of the complaints even when Mr. Uh, Brown, uh, Mr. Shu is a lot of people know him 
as was in downtown before downtown was jumping like it is now. He was telling a lot of young people at that time, they were probably, I'm in my 50s now, so they might have been in their 30s and 40s at the time, you need to jump on bandwagon and try to get a piece of the pie. A lot of us mm-hmm. did not listen to him, uh, much to our regret. So I just wondered, do you right. think that that is still going on, that enough of us are not listening, or are we getting our piece of the pie? I do know there's Black Wall Street, um, the Black August in the Park is definitely encouraging black business leaders, and there are a lot of them that are doing do great innovative things like folk up and things of that yeah. nature. But yeah. do you feel that we're doing enough, or can we do more? Well, that's obviously a, a relevant question for me as you – I don't know if you know or not, but Carl and I are partners on the Private 1898 Project, so I'm a part owner in that space. And one of the reasons why uh, I was excited about it when Carl brought me the idea um, and asked me to, 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 to be a part of it was, was because I do see a, a huge gap in uh, people of color, black folks in particular, participating in the economy in Durham and being able to benefit from it. From, uh, benefit from the, the economy and from a business ownership perspective. And Provident 1898 is a tangible way to make that happen. But if you ask me if we're doing enough in the city, absolutely not. Um, you know, there are uh, – <laughs> I, I was uh, in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago speaking to some elders, some older uh, black activists in L.A., and one of the things that one of the older women said to me was, white people get financing and black people get programs. And it really stuck with me because she's right, right? We get a program, some sort of minority uh, certification or some sort of supplier diversity program, but we don't get financing for our projects. So if you were to ask me, uh, you know, what public financing we got for private in 1898, um, you could probably guess what the answer is for that. But what public, what are the, how are we as a community incentivizing and financing Black and Latinx and, and minority-owned businesses. We're not. And, and we're doing it from, in, in a very minimal way. You get what you incentivize. My economic strategy says that clearly. You get what you incentivize. Our community has uh, some beautiful amenities that were incentivized by public dollars, things like the DPAC, things like One City Center, that we love, and they're beautiful, and they're gorgeous. And they've made our city uh, a great place and more attractive to tourism. Um, but now it's time for us to start to incentivize projects that work for all of them, and specifically underserved mi- and minority businesses. We got to put our money where our mouth is as a community. Um, and enough of the talk about our, you know programs, and enough of the talk about some sort of mentorship or you know those things are important. But we need to put the money where our mouth is, and I think as a city we're not doing a great job of that. And the proof the proof is in the pudding, as they say. You saw the study. I think four percent of businesses downtown are black owned uh, in a city that's forty. 40- 40 plus percent black, uh, that should be alarming to us. And we should all be, we should all be pointing, pointing the fingers at our elected officials and say, hey, what, what are we doing about this? And, 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 and I don't think enough is, enough is being said about that. And uh, we also don't seem to be doing enough to encourage our folks in terms of our education. I mean, we've got like black charter schools, we've got definitely North Carolina Central, and even organizations like KTI and things of that nature, and Spirit House. And I don't know that we're giving them enough support. Either So it seems like we're not even supporting the organizations that are supposed to be our crown jewels in terms of actually giving them the kind of support that they need. Like if you were part of that amazing, I was telling Dean before you got on the call um, and even before Zane got on, that that was just an amazing event. I mean, we had youth of, uh, and hip-hop artists of all ages. I think the oldest one yeah. might be close to my age because I can't forget his name. It began with a J, but I know he definitely was in <laughs> that 50 age, 50 age range. And uh-huh. then there were people down to, like, the black space folks who were, like, teenagers. That's right. Yeah, it was beautiful, man. It was one of the most, I, I, you know, I was obviously in tears during my piece, but I would have been in tears regardless just because it was that beautiful, man. There were so many creators of all different generations doing what we did. And, you know, we don't invest enough in the creative arts in our city. We, you know, we, we, have, we have thrived in spite of lack of investment in creativity, lack of investment in educational opportunities. I will say that there are people, uh, I should say for sure, there are people, both elected officials, both activists, community organizers, there are people in those spaces doing a tremendous job in advocating for the most marginalized in our community. Um, So I'd be remiss if I don't point out the fact that there are people doing good work and encouraging all the things that we just talked about. I think it's just time to apply the economics to it, right? So let's start talking about the money. Right for our institutions. Let's start talking about the money for our businesses. Let's start talking about the money for the arts. You know, let's 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 fund Haytime more. 
let's 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 figure out ways to uh, fund 